Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. A very warm welcome to all of you to the second day of Tech 2018. I hope you had a good time yesterday and are all excited and energized to enjoy another great day of some good sessions. So without further ado, I welcome our first keynote speaker for the day, Jeffrey Morrison. Jeffrey Morrison is a US international lawyer and managing director of the Brexit Legal Network Limited. He has graduated from the Harvard Law School and is a member of the bar in California and New York. He has more than 45 years of experience in US international litigation matters and tax disputes and has dealt with the Swiss bank secrecy matters, RICO and high profile cases of white collar crime. He has also worked as an independent consultant with Evershed Sutherland and published extensively on legal, scientific, commercial, industrial, linguistic, and historical subjects. Ladies and gentlemen, with a huge round of applause, let's welcome our first keynote speaker for the day, Jeffrey Morrison. He will be talking on artificial intelligence in education, who owns and who manages. Thank you. I think I... Well, good morning, and thank you very much for that uh, uh, exuberant and slightly embarrassingly uh, exaggerated introduction. I hope that what I have to say here will somewhat live up to the billing. Here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to restate the theme and my predictions about it. I'm going to talk quickly about some terms and conditions. I'm going to then invite you to a nine-point interactive learning experience with me on how to become an international IP lawyer in five minutes. Then I'm going to open up questions and answers, and then I will sum up in a couple of words. So number one, the theme and my predictions. The theme is artificial intelligence in education, who owns and who manages. Here's what my conclusions are, and this will be supported in a paper that I will submit to the um, conference organizers when I get back to England. My general conclusions are that US law will resist granting broad intellectual property protection, such as copyright, patent, trademark, and trade secrets, to output created by artificial intelligence in the edutech field and that the well-established legal doctrines of fair use and first sale will play important roles in tempering the concentration of monopoly commercial power to which must be added the creative use of individual US state laws regarding property, contract, privacy, consent, agency, and employment. If US history is a guide, the rules of the game will be worked out by a combination of industry competition, government intervention, ongoing consultative action by and among various stakeholders such as academia, teachers, students, institutions, and transnational bodies such as the UN, plus alternatives offered by free data groups as well as ultimate determinative adjudications by the courts, principally for the USA in the Supreme Court of the United States as regards federal law. Okay, that's, the, that's enough of that. That's the, the technical stuff. There'll be no more of that. Next, the terms and conditions. This is more the real world. I asked the uh, colleagues at the conference uh, organizing staff to help me find examples of terms and conditions at websites in India where online educational services are offered. In other words, real life situation. You're a student, you're a teacher, you're a parent, you go online to a website in India that is offering educational services. And there will be somewhere in there terms and conditions or terms of use or privacy policy. I would imagine that not many people click and then go and read those terms, and if they do, here's the type of thing that's waiting for them. And these are, have not been selected by me to prove a point. This is the way the world works, especially from the perspective of a California lawyer. Here is a 
set of terms and conditions of a company called Coursera, which I believe is known to you here. I've, ha I've printed these out. They are 11 pages of what's called legalese. And here's what it says on page five, if anybody gets that far. I'll just read this one part. And let's just see how this grabs you. This is just on page five. The services are managed by Coursera, which is located in Santa Clara County, California. You agree that any dispute related to these terms will be governed by the laws of the state of California, excluding its conflict of law provisions. You further consent to the personal jurisdiction of and exclusive venue in the federal and state courts located in Santa Clara County, California, as to a legal forum for any such dispute. So what you've just agreed, if there's any dispute, you have to go to California and fight about it. You know, good luck. There's another one from a, uh, an organization called Guru, G-O-O-R-U dot org, which I presume you're familiar with. But it's an Indian offering. Uh, this one is 13 pages. And on page 11, it also says that it's governed by California law, but it says it in a slightly different way. You, li you literally have to be a lawyer to understand what this stuff means. Uh, next point, which I tried to make in my panel, you do not have to consent to these things. You do not have to be treated uh, to what's called in America a contract of adhesion. In other words, take it or leave it. One of these also compels you to arbitrate in California if they wish you to. So these are binding under California law. I'm not going to criticize either of these companies for attempting to pursue their commercial interests. But these are serious matters involving legal consequences. But the same is true for you. You have intellectual property that you already own or will create that they want and your data and your input is more valuable to them than anything they can give you in return. Next point. If I can just find my notes here. The learning experience. This will not be like law school. Uh, law school is not very pleasant. But here's our, my example of a quick law school course. I'm going to read nine questions to you, and I'm going to ask you to think about them. Who should own the intellectual property in? That will be the theme for every question. Who should own the intellectual property in? A photograph taken by chemical or digital means. Number two. Who should own the intellectual property in a photograph taken by a monkey trained by a human being? Three, who should own the intellectual property in a discovery made by a human during a dream or a trance? Number four, who should own the intellectual property in a paper perforated strip which allows a machine to play music which otherwise is only on paper in musical notation, like a piece of paper. Number five, who should own the intellectual property in something that has been jointly created by a human and artificial intelligence interaction? Number six, who should own a pharmaceutical made from your blood sample when you go in for a standard test and consent to your blood being used for the test and instead your DNA is used to create a medical product that earns billions of dollars? Number seven, 
who should own the intellectual property created only by artificial intelligence that has first been set in motion by a human being? Number eight, who should own the intellectual property in data that you input with the blinking of your eyes and the clicking of your mouse and your selection of words to read or use in what you think are your private communications? Who should own that intellectual property? And finally, number nine, and there could be a thousand of these, but this is a short session, and I'm already halfway through. Who should own the intellectual property in a situation where a university or academic institution provides a laboratory, a salary, equipment, research funding, and that leads to the invention or discovery of something of great value either in human terms or monetary terms? Those are the questions. I'd like you to think about them. But now let me put them into type, some type of a, of a legal context. Intellectual property is, is protected in a number of ways in the law. Copyrights and patents, trade secrets and trademarks, and also by means of contract, agency, and employment laws, as well as by governmental regulation. Let's go down those very, very quickly, and please be thinking of those nine questions. Uh, copyright is a legal protection of intellectual property that is based upon original creations by human beings. And the duration of that protection is monopolistic. If you have a copyright, you have a legal monopoly, oftentimes for as long as 100 years. The general rule in the world is 70 years after death. The U.S. rules are more complicated because the U.S. has only recently adopted that more common rule. So you can say that 100 years is a good average for that legal monopoly. Pretty long time. Patents also give you a legal monopoly, and they must be based upon an invention that is new, useful, and non-obvious. There, the length of time for your legal monopoly is not as long as 100 years. It's 20 years, but in practical terms, it may be shorter. Trade secrets, as the name imply, are something that is a secret. It's not the subject of a patent or a copyright. The recipe for Coca-Cola, no one has yet figured that out. It's a trade secret. The legal monopoly there lasts forever. The same is true of trademarks. If you have a proper trademark and treat it properly, then the protection of your monopoly can be forever. And then we come to contract, agency, employment, and regulation. All of these different mechanisms operate together, and there's a lot of history in the United States about how these operate together. And so now let's go back to our nine questions. We have eight minutes left, so we're right on time. I'll give you the answers to the questions, and then please be thinking about them. Who should own the copyright in a photograph taken by chemical or digital means? No human intervention. Who should own the copyright? Well, perhaps. I'll give you the answer. The, uh, this is a very famous U.S. Supreme Court case in 1884. These are old issues. People were smart then, too, and they wanted to fight the right answer. You probably have seen, it's a very famous photograph of Oscar Wilde. He made his famous visit to New York, and he's sitting with his flowing hair, and he's sitting with his silk pantaloons or breeches. Very famous photograph and it was prepared by a photographer called Mr. Saroni, and somebody saw it and said, I'll buy one copy of those, and I'll turn it into a lithograph. And the lithograph became very, very successful and made a great deal of money, and the lawsuit was about who owned the copyright. In that case, the argument was that the photograph had been made primarily 99% by chemical means. 
it's a lens, it's silver nitrate or whatever involved, it's light, nothing to do with Mr. Cerrone. It's not like sitting down and writing the Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. But Mr. Cerrone won the case. The photograph copyright belongs to the person who has arranged the work of art, the way Oscar Wilde was sitting, the way the lighting fell upon him. That was considered a sufficient act of human creation for the Supreme Court to affirm that monopoly. Next one, photograph taken by a monkey trained by a human. Sounds very silly, but it's the same concept. And that was the subject of a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals decision in April of this year in which the federal courts in California had to decide whether a selfie taken by a macaque monkey owned by a British photographer was subject to the monopoly granted by copyright. Rather than dismiss this as something very silly, it's not silly, it's the same concept. The monkey was given legal status to bring the lawsuit, must have, otherwise there wouldn't be a lawsuit, but the court decided that under those circumstances there was not enough human intervention. Number three, discovery made by a human during a dream. The chemists in the audience will know about Mr. Kekule, who was reading a book about the Ouroboros, you know, the snake that bites its own tail, and he went to bed that night, and during that dream, he figured out the benzene ring. So who owns the discovery made by a human during a dream? Well, all I can tell you in the time available, which is a few minutes, is the US Copyright Office has detailed guidelines as to what can be copyrighted. I'm talking copyright, not patents. And it says, the office may register a work where the application or the deposit copyright copies note that the work was inspired by a divine spirit. It's from the official copyright. So there is, there is uh, ample room there to make legal arguments. Number four, paper strip, which can play copyrighted sheet music. You have a sheet music, perceptible by the human eye, don't hear the music unless you can read music. Strip of paper, it could be like the jacquard, punched cards, it's the same idea. It plays the music. Very difficult case for the Supreme Court of the United States in 1907. How should that case be decided? How much intervention was there? You have the copyright of the music, which is protected and someone comes along and simply buys one copy of the sheet music, turns it into holes in a sheet of paper that plays pianos. And since there are many, many more people that can listen to a piano than, than can read sheet music, guess which one made the money? Right, the player pianos. So who should win that case under copyright law? Any, any guesses? Be the Supreme Court of the United States in 1907. How would you decide the case? The music composer. You want it to be the music composer, don't you? Because you feel that's morally right. Well, be disappointed. <laughs> but, that's the reason I've chosen this example, you sense that the correct moral conclusion is for the composer to win. But Congress then in 1909 fixed it. They changed the law. So that's, an, that's regulation in my list. Next one, intellectual property created jointly by a human and artificial intelligence interaction. Answer to that, we don't know yet. Number six, the blood case. Mr. Moore was a patient in California. He gave a blood sample. He gave consent. You may use my blood. He, they used his blood for his purposes, but they went on and they developed a pharmaceutical based upon his unique DNA configurations, and they produced a pharmaceutical product that earned $3 billion, and they paid Mr. Moore nothing. So there again,
um, Sandra, I'm sure, will feel that the, morally he should be like the composer. Well, he lost. And he lost in California, which is a liberal state. So the theme here is it's difficult. So Mr. Moore, his personal data was used, and he gave consent. But he didn't give consent to that. But consent is a dangerous thing. It can have consequences that you have to think about very, very carefully. So when you sign a term of use, and it says these things you don't understand, beware. Next, intellectual property created solely by artificial intelligence interaction set in motion only by a human being. So it's a little bit like the camera case. It's a little bit like the piano case. Number seven, we don't know yet. Next, who owns the intellectual property or should own the intellectual property in the data gathered by those eye contacts and those word selections? When you go on a website and it is tracking them and running them through an algorithm and comparing it to millions of other people, who should own that? We don't know yet. And number nine, famous case decided recently by the US Supreme Court, this is the academic research situation. In this case, it was Stanford University. They provided the laboratory. They provided the money. And someone invent, found something very valuable. Who should win the case? The lonely scientist dealing with the mysteries of the universe or the great big pharmaceutical company, Hoffman LaRoche, which developed the pharmaceutical? Or should it be Stanford University? The Supreme Court decided, how do you want the case to be decided? Sandra. Morally. All right. Welcome to the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, that, is the, that is the same answer that was decided by the US Supreme Court. So there is a logic. There is morality. There are difficult issues. We can do it together. And so my final question, my final admonition, I've got two seconds left, is go, be like Mr. Kekule. Be like the macaque monkey that took selfies. Go out with your dreams. The law will be there to support you and protect you. And usually, it will get the moral answer. But don't sign things you don't understand. So I think there's a minute for questions and answers. I can't believe I've answered all your questions. That would not be good. Well, if there are no questions, yes, then I'll. Yes, there is a question. Mr. Moran? I have a group of eighth graders sitting here that came from a school nearby, and they have to provide a report back to the class. Can you sum up two, three points they took back home to their teachers and other students? Well, if they can wait until my paper is uh, online, I <laughs> no, think No, no, right will... now and here, because they're going back tomorrow, and they have report duties, and I try to explain yes, I to can, them. I can sum it up. That... It's for you. The, the, the data that you create, whether it's for your report or whether it's in your classroom or whether it's talks with your parents or your schoolmates who may be in Australia or who may be in Canada, that is important data input that belongs to you. And you should not underestimate its commercial value or its social value. Remembering that the conference topic is education for humanity. And so be thinking of the moral uses of what you discover and what's of interest to you. And usually the law will support you. But don't give it away. Don't consent without understanding what you're doing. OK. I've got Anything else? I've got so then I'll give up the floor then to someone else. And I'm, of course, be One more question. I've got, a, I've got one question. Yes. At the end, there were two or three questions that you said haven't been answered yet. And you also said there were good moral logical answers that, would, uh, that, that have been given to these questions in the past. So I want you to give the good moral correct answer to the two or three questions you didn't answer. Well, I think that 
one of them was who should own the intellectual property in the um, novelties that are created by human and AI interaction. Right, that's a really important question. So you tell us what you think the proper answer to that should be. I think that the emphasis should be in favor of the creative human being. And that also happens to be, thank you. Uh, don't applaud me. If from America, although I appreciate it, the founders of the US nation in 1787 and 1788, they thought and worried about this issue, and they were very, very clear that it is the individual human being who should win. And that's why some of these cases have been decided by the US Supreme Court in that way. It's the Yes, I know, and I, I can refer you later on to a particular U.S. case in which uh, the Court of Appeals went into a three-part test to deal with this. It doesn't resolve all the issues, but it's referred to in my paper. Uh, I believe the human should win and the human will win, uh, that you need good advocacy, you, you, you have to be careful of consent, and you have to know what your rights are and be diligent in asking about them. Was, and then the other one was what should be the ownership of intellectual property that is allegedly created solely by artificial intelligence. My answer to that is there ain't no such animal. It's always going to be humans, I hope. Thank you very much.